Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Now, I know that this video is not going to be as thrilling of the one I did about Valery Gergiev getting his ass canned. I know that's what really drives traffic and that's what people want to hear about. Sorry, this one is only going to be about music. And what that means, unfortunately, is that the traffic is going to be vastly lower. And I think there's something like wrong with that. I really do. But that's the way it goes. I'm resigned to it. And this is, this is a, actually a very interesting disc we're going to be talking about. Now, you remember a few videos ago, <clears throat> I talked about this very odd disc of six discs of American classics on Warner. And it contains music by Gershwin and Bernstein and Barber and Korngold and Copeland and Adams and Glass and Reich and Gershwin and Porter and Kern and Gershwin and J.P. Johnson and Gershwin and Ellington and Gershwin and more Gershwin. That's what was in it. Done by a whole slew of people, um, not generally associated with the repertoire, but they're fine. I mean, the performances were okay. and But it was a really weird, weird collection. And and it was a very conservative collection, a very uninteresting collection, except for the sort of popular music, jazz-influenced pieces. Those were okay, but American music is so much more, and they had six discs to try and do something with it, and they didn't. And it's all the more interesting because what we are going to talk about is this cheapy, cheapy two-disc set on Vox called American Orchestral Music in the American Composers series. Now, this is still around somewhere, somehow, theoretically. It's out there. I, I got a new copy of it because my other copy is in the overflow room. And so I just wanted to make sure that it would still show up. And it did. And what have we got here? Well, this is two discs. And in only two discs, you have such a more interesting and comprehensive panorama of American orchestral music than we ever got from this thing. And I find that striking, very striking. Don't you? What do we have? Well, here's what we get. First, Virgil Thompson, The Suite from the Louisiana Story, which is actually very timely because we just did a video on his two film scores, The Plow That, Bro that Broke the Plains and The River. And so we have this beautiful suite from the Louisiana Story. It's performed by the Westphalian Symphony Orchestra, that fabulous Thompson organ, conducted by Siegfried Landau the conductor, and actually, it's quite good. I mean, the recording is a little faded, granted. I mean, these things were, were originally recorded back in, well, the dawn of time. Let's see, Schuller was released, let's see, in 1971, 1973. Okay, so it's not that old, but, it, you know, the orchestra was not the greatest in the universe, but it's really quite good stuff. And so I'd like to play you a little excerpt from the opening. The opening is a pastoral. Um, we love pastoral music, don't we? Um, from the Louisiana story here, which demonstrates that Virgil Thompson really knew his Ravel, particularly L'Enfant et le Sortiège, you know, the second half where the naughty child goes outside into the garden and these haunting harmonies are coming mysteriously. Well, here are the haunting harmonies, or at least his, Virgil Thompson's version of those haunting harmonies. It's quite lovely. Here you go.
good stuff, isn't it? And, you know, the Westphalian Symphony Orchestra does perfectly well under Siegfried Landau. And then we have Ned Roram's Third Symphony. Now, this is unquestionably one of the great American symphonies. I'll take it over, over Harris or Schumann or any of those people any day. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece. It has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five movements sort of tied together in various ways. It's more like a suite, and I don't care. It's glorious. And I'm going to play you a bit of the scherzo now. This is performed with the Utah Symphony under Maurice Abravanel. And this is a classic recording. It's coupled with the William Schumann Seventh Symphony, which is also on here. And we'll talk about that in a second. But a, really a wonderful, wonderful pairing of American music that some of you mentioned when we, way back when we were talking about the Ned Roram box and stuff like that. But, oh, this is a wonderful, wonderful work. And if you don't know it, you can either get it on Naxos or you can get it this way. There was a live recording with Bernstein. It's just marvelous. And it really should be played like constantly. It's only 20 minutes long. It's a first half piece. The problem is, it's such a good piece, it would probably, you know, dwarf into insignificance most second half pieces. Anyway, here's a bit of the scherzo. Vintage Americana, is it not? As is, quite frankly, the William Schumann Seventh Symphony. Now, I said before, I am not a fan of William Schumann. I find his style rather dry and, and just lacking in, in thematic substance. I mean, his music always sounds like it's melodic, but it doesn't have a melody. It needs a tune. It's looking for one and not finding it. And anyway, but the seventh, I mean, it's, it's, it's his style. And quite a few of you mentioned that you enjoyed his music and like that style, which is perfectly great. And the seventh is, is vintage Schumann in that particular style. That is, you know, you've got your obligatory fugue and you've got the sort of lapidary scoring and the interesting rhythm. That really is one of the more, more nice things about his music is his handling of rhythm. And it's a, it's a good symphony for what it is. You'll like it more than I do. And it's also with Bravanel and the Utah Symphony, another classic recording. So that's disc one. And I mean, what's not to love? Disc two. On disc two, I'm getting myself confused here, we've got, I'm not going to take these in order because I want to end with something else. Anyway, the Gunther Schuller Symphony 1965. Now, Schuller was really kind of a fascinating guy. He was the pioneer of, of a lot of sort of musical trends that didn't pan out, one of which was third stream music, which was a mixture of, of classical and jazz, but modernist classical and jazz, sort of cool atonal jazz with cooler atonal classical music. That was his thing. And then he sort of became just an eclectic and did all kinds of stuff. I mean, he orchestrated Tremonisha, by Joplin. He was, he was heavily involved in all kinds of musical things, both at the New England Conservatory and at the Manhattan School of Music. He wrote a bunch of books, including The Complete Conductor, which is completely insane. I had a huge screaming fight with him over that book. Um, at one point, we had a wonderful time. I mean, he was a wonderful guy. <laughs> he really was. And, and, and I, really, I really liked him and enjoyed his company, but he was a little bit touched, if you know what I mean. One of his theories in The Complete Conductor was that all orchestral instruments should be played in romantic symphonies, mind you, um, at the volume of the weakest of them. So in other words, when a composer writes general fortissimo for the entire orchestra, the loudest you're allowed to get is as loud as like the bassoon can play. 
or the flu. It was a terrible idea, a ridiculous idea. And to demonstrate it, he, the book originally came with a couple CDs. It was a Beethoven fifth, I believe, and a Brahms first. The dullest, most lifeless performances of that music you've ever heard in your life. Because none of it could ever be louder than a bassoon, so the dynamic range was completely out of whack. It was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Everything was tamped down and ugh, ugh. It was crazy, and we had a huge fight about that. But the book was otherwise full of very, very interesting and useful comments about specific works based on his own experience of them. I mean, he was a remarkable musician and, and just kind of, you know, had his theories and didn't care if they corresponded to any demonstrable form of musical reality. That's all right. So Symphony 1965, of which I have a sample here, is performed. Who's doing this little sucker? Um, it's oh, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra under Donald Johannes. I mean, that's always very good, right? That's great stuff. And it's being, it, 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 it's a squeak bloop atonal thing. I mean, maybe not quite as squeaky and bloopy as some of the atonal things that were being composed in that period, but it's pretty close. And the opening movement, of which we're going to hear the first minute or so, is marked moderato with majesty. And the moderato part I get, the majesty, I don't know where that comes in, but listen for yourself and see if you, if you disagree. <laughs> It's Schiller's view of Majestic, what can I say? And the rest of the symphony sort of squeaks and bloops its way <laughs> for the next four movements through the end. And interestingly, it's, it has that sort of streak of neoclassicism or academicism that you find in Schumann's music and here and in a lot of other composers of this period, especially American composers. It's got, it's got like a, a fugue, a canon, and a monody at the end. I mean, in, in, in the, in the uh, second movement, pardon me, which is also marked solemnly, that comes after the majesty. Then there's a scherzo and trio, and a finale that returns to the tempo, if perhaps not the majesty, of the first movement. But you can sort of tell, you know, what school he's coming from, although the style is his own, and so that's what makes it very interesting. And we also get, let's see, oh, Edward McDowell, suite number two. The Indian Suite, and that's with the Westphalian Symphony Orchestra, again, under Siegfried Landau. And that's, you know, that's an easy piece to do um, for the orchestra, so it comes off quite well. It's not an issue. All of these performances just need a good boost to the volume, you know, to give them the necessary impact. But once you do that, the recordings themselves are usually pretty good. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty solid. However, the first thing on disc number two, which is the last thing we're going to talk about, is Howard Hansen's Symphony Number no. 6. And this is a very, very good piece. It's, it's a single movement, six movement sort of, sort of confabulation of various things. And the last movement, which is only two minutes long, actually appeared on my own disc, Earquake, with the Helsinki Philharmonic. And of course, here it's with Siegfried Landau and the music for Westchester Symphony Orchestra, whereas we had the Helsinki Philharmonic under Leif Segerstein with an aerobic dance entertainer. 
bopping away to the music, up and down and very athletically to give you some extra visual appeal. Well, that's obviously not on this particular disc. And, you know, the performance itself, though, is quite good. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. And it really is a symphony that deserves to be heard once in a while. Again, it's like 20 minutes long. Most of these symphonies are like that. The Roram is 20 minutes long. They're, they're just a nice, nice length to put them all together on a single disc or a couple discs. So here is the finale of Howard Hansen's Symphony No. 6. fun. I mean, it's great stuff. So this little, little two-disc set gives you more of what American music has been since the days of Edward McDowell than this six-disc wannabe extravaganza. And I just, I, it's, you know, that's what happens when you have much better programming. Now, I don't know if Vox had much better programming because some, you know, brain behind it programmed it that way, or this is just what they had sitting around. But in the day, they recorded a lot more interesting music. There's a lot of stuff on this label, and it needs badly. I mean, Naxos owns it now, so it really needs to be organized and, and you know, in, in a logical sequence of some kind, because there's all kinds of great stuff. But it comes and goes, and it's hard to find, and it's, you know, someone needs to get a handle on it. And I don't know if they don't want to bother because they don't think that CDs are long for this world. But however they do it, um, it needs to be done. And until then, you can get this American orchestral music thing. I do want to add, you cannot find it under any of the composers. If you want to find it like on Amazon, just type in American Orchestral Music Vox and it'll show up and you'll see it. That's the way to do it with these collections because all of these retail catalogs are organized by album title, not by composer, not by work. And it, it's horrible. I mean, you know, the, these things are just such a mess now. But that's one place to find it. That's one way to do it. So I think everyone should own this. It's splendid if you can find it or download it or do something with it. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. Take care. <laughs>